So this may come as a massive shock to you, but it appears that Lucius is the biggest dick in the universe. Hello everybody and welcome to another spoiler review of a Black Library novel. I am the Border Prince and today we are going to be discussing Lucius the Faultless Blade by Ian St. Martin. Now if you've never listened to one of these before, basically I'm going to just have a, a rough outline of the book with no spoilers or very very limited spoilers and also discuss the author and then we'll go into a sort of spoiler rundown of what happens in the book. And throughout, I'll be giving my thoughts on it and, you know, trying to be slightly entertaining. So the book itself has recently been released in August of 2017. And it's written by Ian St. Martin. Now, looking through Ian's, uh, what do you say, biography, whatever, I don't know. Um, he appears to be a relatively recent uh, addition to the Black Library uh, author pool, I suppose. Um, I haven't myself seen read any of his other works they for the most part they seem to be concerned about um death watch for the most part he's also done a couple of chaos short stories and yeah yeah he's done a few short stories on lucius uh which i'll, I'll attempt to pick up to be honest um the, the couple of them are audio books so he must be doing okay to have been given the audio book um platform from the start at the back of his little memorandum it says that uh he's uh from washington dc so he's a yank I don't hold that against him. <laughs> there is one that I, I remember seeing ages ago, but I completely forgot about it. But looking now at his, uh, whatever you say, discography or whatever, the Champions of the Eternal War, which does look pretty sweet, actually. I will have a look at this. Cause it's got this Space Wolf character in that they've recently created that I never heard of before. Uh, I've got to catch up on the Fenris stuff because uh, of some other stuff I've been reading. It seems like that's an important uh, bit of lore that I'm I'm missing out on, so I'm going to have to boost myself up. So in terms of the book itself, do I think he's done a good job? I do. I really do think he's done a good job. I'm, I'm quite happy with how he's approached it. The only gripe I've got is they are slanesh, which means they need to be more perverse. They might just be me being a nerd to all the uh, the blood and the violence and the sacrifices and the extreme murder and so on. But if it's Slanesh, I want sticky, horrible, disgusting debauchery, you know? Not not because I want it, it's just because that's 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 what Slanesh is. I mean, you know, if you're going to do it, you've got to do it properly. So what happens in this book? We meet one of Lucius's second-in-command, who is leading an attack to board a Chaos, a Corn Champions ship, in order to get slaves, because they use the slaves for their apothecary, who is formerly of... Fabius Biles Consortium to produce uh, drugs, basically, uh, narcotics that uh, temporarily allow the Slaneshi Marines, those who have fallen to the Dark Prince, to be able to feel once more. Because unfortunately, they've been doing, doing so much stuff, so much debauchery, so much horror, that they uh, have lost the ability to feel anymore. Their nerves are shot out. They get no pleasure from the extreme acts of violence they commit. They're sort of walking around all dulled and numbed, you know, like uh, like heroin addicts without any hair on. So basically, that's their raison d'etre. That's their reason for existence. They're on a strike cruiser, which is, of course, because they're Slanesh, called the Diadem. Yeah, basically, they've been a roving warband, and they call themselves the uh, Cohorus Niscia, which, with my extremely limited knowledge of Latin, I believe means band of narcissists, which... I'm happy to be wrong on that if anyone does know better Latin. Yeah, a band or a gang, I guess. Which is quite appropriate for Lucius' sort of bodyguard, his personal army. And basically, these guys' story is, since the Scalafrax battle, where the, both the uh, World Eaters and the Emperor's children were scattered, I suppose you'd say, they have been roving around, doing what they do, getting slaves, killing people, fighting against the war bands, blah, 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 blah. It's been a good old laugh in the Eye of Terror. Basically, after this engagement, things have gone a bit too far. They've lost too many men, they've lost too many marines, they've lost too many resources. Their war band is on the sort of edge of oblivion. And so, Lucius basically takes up the offer from an old friend who's, uh, you might call him a doctor. And, and they end up going to the dark city of Camera 
or at least some of them do. And what ensues is a vast conflict with uh, the Dark Elder, basically in the gladiatorial pits where uh, Lucius proceeds to butcher everybody <laughs> um, in a repeated fashion with multiple kills and also glorious little speeches and amazing, mm, I don't know, the amount of time someone gets their head crushed by someone treading on it uh, is, is quite impressive. Now, I'll get into this in spoilers more, but this is basically the overview. In terms of how it's written, fantastic. The characterizations are really good. In terms of, again, this is like the Fabius Bar novel. Things happen, but not much is happening in terms of the grand scale of things. And in terms of the lore, you get snippets which are fascinating. And I'm really looking forward to what they do with uh, Fabius Bar and Lucius. I think they're two of the most interesting Chaos characters. Lucius is... Uh, a slavering devotee of Slanesh. He is. He's a, he's a narcissistic, psychopathic, murdering bastard. And he's an arsehole to everybody he meets, which is fascinating and funny. Um, and that's the thing with the book. The book is entertaining in that way. It's got, it's got a lot of humor in it. It's got a lot of jokes. It's got a lot of wink winks to people. Yeah, it was, it was thoroughly entertaining. It was a good romp. You know, this isn't a Horace Heresy novel where they're getting all, you know, deep on shit or it's divulging great secrets of the background this is a good old romp with a chaos war band and uh with lucius the eternal mocking people and then killing them so yeah if, if that's what you're after this is the perfect book for you and i highly recommend it in terms of um its wider impact on the law it is interesting and we'll just get into that shortly and i'll give a bit more of a detailed view on this and some of the characters because i don't want to I want to be careful of spoiling it too much for people because, you know, you might not get the uh, the entertainment value out of it. But if you have read it or if you want to hear the spoilers and you're not too fussed about that, which I don't know why you would want to do that, read the fucking book first. Then please listen to the spoiler rundown and the uh, interesting tidbits of lore that I have gleaned from this great work. Before we go on, if you are interested, please see the relevant link below, which is an affiliate link to Amazon where you can pick up the book. And yeah. Yeah, give it a go. It's a good little read, and I, I, I hope that this shows a bit more of an expansion for the Chaos Swords, give them a bit more character as we go forward, particularly in the new era of the Dark Imperium. Um, I think Chaos are going to be a far bigger... I mean, they've always been a bigger element of it, but I want more from them. Uh, like Slan like uh, Lucius does, I want more. <laughs> so... Yeah, if you're interested, take a look, um, and we're going to go into spoilers in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, so that was just a basic view of the book itself, without spoilers. Now we're going to get into fucking spoilers. Now this shit's going to go down. Right, so. They're on a strike cruiser called the Diadem. The Diadem is piloted by a child, a girl, of about 7 or 8 years old, that's possessed by a demon, who's the captain of the ship. The ship itself is, it's corrupted, but not to the degree that, like, you know, it's got fucking arms and eyes on the hull. The crew are, for the most part, the original crew from the Crusader fleet, and with the occasional replacement of a mutant or some crew member they've captured in raids. So a lot of them have the original uniforms on of the Empress children, and have probably been serving for hundreds of years within the ship since the fall of Terra. The ship itself has got uh, different levels because it's quite big. Um, there is clans of mutants that war with each other and they use the shock troops and so on. There is a representative of the Dark Mechanicum on the ship who is, uh, yeah, he's, uh, as you would expect with a slanesh influenced Dark Mechanicum guy, he's into all kinds of weird shit. So, you know, there's servitors who probably are alive, cyborgs, genuinely, not just servitors. And, and that's pretty much the ship. Uh, Lucius says he's got his own hall, which is, of course, surrounded by mirrors, so he can see himself at all times. And that's a big orgy pit. Uh, orgy murder pit. An orgy murder pit, I should say. So that's fun. Okay, so basically the warband has been depleted to a very small level. Now they go to war with a... Uh, they meet a corn ship, which is a battered old hulk of a craft that they've strapped engines to and strapped guns to. It's full of slaves and world eaters now the diadem runs up to it um they have a little conflict in space which is pretty nice and um they board the ship and their objective is to take slaves 
because they have a drug called Ambrosia, which their apothecary, who is a member of the consortium, or former member of the consortium, of, the consortium, of Fabius Boyle, uh, can produce a drug called Ambrosia from the the essence of slaves. Um, and he takes them apart, you know, uses their brain matter, probably their soul as well. And creates this drug which allows the Slaneshi troopers, the Slaneshi space marines, sorry, to um, to feel for a brief amount of time and he heightens their senses. Because without this, they've become so dulled and inured to the pain and violence and sensation in general. Their nerves have been blown out, that they are sluggish creatures, that they're, they're not what they should be. They're, they're just not enthusiastic about things. But when they get the ambrosia, it's like pff, straight to them, you know. They're, they're, they're in the zone, you know. Basically, they're having this boarding action. And then, because it's the Eye Terror, a planet just appears and sucks down the corn ship with the, slant, with the uh, Empress children on board. Lucius needs to go down there and rescue the uh, troops that have survived the crash and are now fighting against the corn guys who have survived the crash as well. And possibly get some slaves who've also managed to survive the crash because then it won't be a complete waste of time. So they go down there and they have... Um, a nice big scrap with the individuals on the planet. Lucius has a single combat with the leader of the corn guys, who was pretty awesome, to be fair. To be fair, he was uh, an interesting character. But basically, the world starts coming apart and sucking people down into pits and so on and destroying them. The Slaneshi dudes manage to escape, but they're depleted. They're depleted. They've gone from like 50 marines down to 20, which is for them it's like their warband their ability to do anything with the idea their ability to defend themselves is probably quite uh, limited now so they decide to go on a bit of a quest to uh find new resources new troops um and for lucius himself he's not fussed about the individuals he lost it's the fact that without these tools for him to utilize he can't do the things he wants to do so he needs more men and they receive a message from Fabius Boyle to uh, come and assist him and he will show them how to get more troops. Now, when they get there, when they finally meet him, they have a whole episode where they have to leave the warp and where they encounter Imperial patrols along the edges of the Eye of Terror who are watching out for this kind of opportunistic uh, single ship slipping through the warp in an attempt to raid the Imperium. They manage to escape that and they meet up with Fabius. Uh, Fabius double-crosses them, or sort of double-crosses them. It turns out in the end that Lucius was in on the whole deal from the start, somehow. And they end up being taken to Camera or Camorra, or whatever you want to say, the Dark Eldar city, or the, sorry, the Dark Aldari, and um, they get put into the murder pits there, the arena, the gladiatorial pits. Lucius proceeds to have multiple fights against beasts, all the time being a complete arsehole, and we'll get into some of his best bits of arsehole in this shortly. Basically, Lucius should have died, and again, we'll talk about Lucius in a moment, um, his particular... Uh, gifts that he's been given by the dark gods and some of the other characters but yeah so he, he they have massive conflicts um they kill more than they should do the elder again they're oh, slightly annoyed about this um but yeah it turns out it's all been a big ploy by fabius Boyle, who has been doing this to multiple chaos warbands capturing them and selling them on to the dark elder in return for knowledge as is his way so within this particular cabal they have multiple um, third legion troops you know noise marines other champions and so on and other space marines um, that have been that were part of these slaneshi war bands who joined up with them lucius manages to break out he releases the troops that are there who now will belong to him pretty much his ship manages to find the dark city through the webway after a little episode and um, with it comes a giant horde of demons who act as a distraction allowing them to escape Fabius Bile as well, of course, raided the archives of the Dark Eldar and uh, took as much info as he could. And they fled the system. On the way out, they meet the Corn guys again, who were gifted by Corn with a demonic possession and their ship to be rebuilt as they were lying, floating through the void after the demon planet, because it's the Eye of Terror again, simply just disappeared. <laughs> after the whole thing and left them floating and their ship floating around so now this demonically possessed corn army with a large contingent of 
demons with them go against the diadem with its with Lucius's new troops and they have a giant conflict a giant boarding action in one of the main halls in the center of the ship the leader is slain by Lucius after a while uh, becoming a vast bloodthirster and again they have a giant conflict but uh, Lucius manages to behead the guy eventually and his new war band is victorious and they have all the glory of the kill and sensation and everything looks like it's going to be lovely and as he stood upon the head of this uh, bloodthirster he gives a little speech agony Lucius roared ecstasy more sensation will be ours again and I will deliver it to you that is our crusade this is the purpose our blades will cut to and the blood of our enemies will spill it we will defeat the deadness of our flesh if we must take our victory from the Phoenician, from the very grip of the gods themselves, we will do it. Agony, the faultless thundered. Oh yeah, sorry, he's called himself the faultless now. Ecstasy, more. So now his warband's called the faultless, um, which is the reason for the name of the book, I suppose. And that's the basic story. Now, we're going to go into uh, a bit of detail on some of the individual characters and the other little tidbits of lore that we get now. So Lucius has an apothecary called Caesar with him, and uh, this guy was formerly of the Fabius Balls Consortium, as I said. And yeah, basically he seems uncorrupted until you realise the fact that he's not aged a day, apparently. And um, yeah, yeah, he's uh, he's a kind of character that's disgusted by what they're doing, who's uh, disappointed in them, who thinks they've failed. And so on, you know, you know what these guys are like. He's a bit hypocritical because he doesn't actually realise how corrupt he is and the kind of activities he's been up to. He has created this ambrosia, um, which apparently he has created in concert with uh, Fabius Bile. We later learn that's where he learned this. So, yeah, that's the first guy. There's also a chaos sorcerer called the Composer. We don't know any other name other than that he's a composer. The rest of the uh, Empress children hate him, but this stems back from the fact that he was probably a librarian or a psyker, anyway. He's embraced the uh, Song of Slanesh, that's his main uh, ambition in life, and he acts as the navigator for the diadem, for the ship. He's an interesting character, he's got a, a little... His, his navigation sanctum is a place of tortured slaves screaming out and so on. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he loves demons, and yeah, he's a he's a nice he's a nice character as a sorcerer. But yeah, it's it's just the fact that the Empress children dis are disgusted by him, they hate him, <laughs> and it's purely because he's a psyker. So they've still got that whole they've still got that legacy from the Emperor's edict from the em from the edict of Nicaea that they hate him. Or it might be the fact that uh, a psyker is an evolution of the human form, and they haven't got it, and so they're not. So he's either the one who isn't perfect or they're the ones who aren't perfect. So the hatred comes from either one of them. It also might just be the fact that uh, they've got this underlying hatred of him. So they, they keep it within them because they're so numb to everything else. If they've got some strong emotion, they don't let it go because it's the only thing they've got left. Uh, a bit of, a, a, they get a tinge of something when they see him. So they probably love that. And it really, you know, it makes the hatred even stronger because they want the hatred. But anyway, he's got a bodyguard um, who's a Terminator, who basically after the Horus Heresy, after they fled to the Eye, went about killing the Phoenician guard so he could take their Terminator armour because he was never allowed to join the uh, elite. So he basically assassinated and murdered all of the Phoenician guard and now he wears Terminator plate marked with each of the names of the people he stole the pieces of armour from. So he's in this massive suit of Terminator armour. And apparently the Terminator armour is, um, because it's a mismatch, a, mis a mismatch, I should say, of different pieces of armour, it wars with him because it's, it hates him for what he did to them and the fact that it's, it's joined all these multiple bits together. So its machine spirit is um, annoyed. But basically uh, the Third Legion hates him as well. And that's why Lucius assigned him to guard the sorcerer, I suppose, because uh, what else are you going to do with them? And um, the sorcerer needs some a bit of a guardian as well because Lucius knows that uh, even he potentially could kill this navigator given the opportunity or being in that certain mind. So yeah, again, the ship is piloted by a demonically possessed child girl 
who stands often on top of her throne to give orders. Um, so you can imagine the uh, comical nature of this. Now, the demon is... There seems to be... I don't know the full details on this, and I don't know whether it's contained in one of the short stories, but uh, the demon seems to have been... He's been pursued by other demons of Slanesh. Um, she has a bodyguard behind her, who is an avatar of Slanesh. Um, it looks like Lucius did some kind of deal, basically, to stop them taking this demon back for punishment in the... Uh, in the pleasure court of the Dark Prince. But uh, that means that there is a bunch of demons on the strike cruiser, basically uh, waiting for the opportunity to, well, for, for Lucius to be gone so that they can reclaim this demon. Once Lucius is captured by Fabius Boyle, there is a large conflict with the uh, Slanesh people, uh, the Slanesh demons, who manifest an attempt to do this uh, to to take back this demon and the uh and the composer and his terminator bodyguard have to basically save her using uh various means uh, brute force and magical shit <laughs> and yeah so so that was all fun there's another couple of individuals on the ship that are interesting there's some squads that are interesting but as i said there's not many of them left um and uh, it mostly the story mostly revolves around these fellas Plus the fact that the, 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 any of the other ones mentioned pretty much are all dead by the end of the book. <laughs> but anyway, but yeah, so let's let's talk about Lucius. So who is Lucius? Well, he is an original member of the Third Legion Emperor's Children. He was an arrogant fucker back then, and he's got more and more arrogant and narcissistic and uh, hubristic since the end of that war. Oh, I suppose it isn't really ended. It's carried on. It's the long war. So, uh, Lucius um, was the comrade of Sol Tarvitz. He joined fully with the Phoenician and in the cause of Slanesh and joining Horus in the, in the betrayal. And he fought all the way through there, uh, fighting on Terra and so on, and then fighting to the Eye of Terra and then fighting within the Eye of Terra for millennia. And yeah, he's, he's one of the top swordsmen in the universe. Um, there are no competitors. And those that have defeated him fall to the curse which was gifted to him by the Dark Prince. Which is, if they take pride in the kill, which of course they're going to. Which you get, uh, The one thing I've got, the one question I've got that no one seems to have the answer is, what if a Necron kills him? Because Necrons sometimes feel emotion. Some of the ones who've kept their, uh, some, some semblance of their personality and their spirit. Apologies for the sound of my phone. But uh, what if just a, a dead one kills him? But that's, that's, that's a question for another time. So, yeah, Lucius has a uh, gift, basically. If someone kills him, they, a few days later, a few weeks later, they'll become him. They'll warp and twist and he'll be reincarnated using their flesh and rebuild himself. And that's what's happened many, many times. And the soul of the person he defeats will be sucked within him. And now he wears a suit of power armor, which is continuously shifting with the screaming faces of those who've defeated him, who have then become part of him. Now, in this book, it is getting a bit too much for old Lucius. The voices are screaming a lot. He seems to have potentially a demon with inside him who is trying to uh, take him basically, um, to, to, to devour him. And he's been fighting this off for a while. But it's the voices for the most part. They, um, their salty senses, they stop him from thinking. He only gets a piece when he's in combat. Until, of course, Fabius Barr provides him with a bunch of new drugs, which we'll get into shortly. Um, but yeah, this is Lucius's problem, really. Um, and the other thing is, the best part of this book, really, is the fact that Lucius is an arsehole. He comes out with ridiculously snarky comments all the time, or just harsh things all the time. <laughs> Which, aside from his ability to, like, kill everybody, because he is literally the, one of the greatest swordsmen in the universe. He just comes out with some amazing stuff. So, for instance, when the corn ship has gone down to the planet, the demon world below... He uh, says about the troops that have uh, been lost on it. Normally, I would say, cut our losses and wash our hands of this, of this fiasco. But our lower decks grow hollow. If there is anything still alive for their holds on the surface, we must go down to extract it. Caesar says, and to recover our brothers, of course. Lucius glanced sidelong at Caesar, still grinning. Of course, we shall rescue our noble kindred, as well as anything else still alive. We need the raw materials for your work, brother. 
we all rely upon you ever so much. And uh, after they're extracted by uh, a Thunderhawk called the Talon Queen, which has a pilot, which is the amalgamated flesh and minds of a bunch of the best pilots in their fleet who competed for this. And they were all grafted together into a big ball of limbs and flesh, which is also quite a nice touch. Lucius uh, is the last one to board. He just manages to jump on as the planet's ripping itself to pieces and the Thunderhawk's taking off. And uh, he's hanging from the uh, the lip of the Thunderhawk, the ramp. Uh, no one moves to help him. And the nearest guy is a uh, sort of, you'd say he's his second in command. And he fights him in a in a duel and rips him to pieces, basically. Um, fairly shortly after, after he challenges for leadership of their band, he, he pulls himself up and says, No, brother, Lucius implored, his hand shooting out with mock sincerity towards Chrysithesis. Chris- 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 to forestall him from rising, please do not dream of exerting yourself. I was quite all right, dangling over all that. And you look so very, very tired. And after this battle, of course, uh, where they've been massacred, basically, their war band's been depleted massively and they've lost a lot of brothers, Lucius just turns to them all in the front door and says, So, my brothers, how was everyone's battle? Which is like, what a tosser, you know. <laughs> Which you get the feeling of, because later on it's um, you get the section saying... Lucius frowned for a moment, curious at the sudden thought. He did not remember when the feeling had left him, or if he had ever possessed it from the start, but he simply could not bring himself to care. The legionaries of the Cohorus Nascia were his blades. When a blade breaks in battle, when it ceases to be useful, it is thrown aside by the one who wields it, who then finds another to replace it. So that's his feeling against his uh, brothers. But it's just the little things that make me laugh in the book. When they're in the arena fighting against the Dark Eldar, one of his brothers who's with him, um, who's look, they're all looking for weapons amongst the uh, the dead and the dying and the uh, detritus of these gladiatorial combats. There's not a piece of steel here I would even deem fit to piss on. Language, chided Lucius, looking up into the baying crowd of, em- of Eldar watching them. Hurry up and find something you can use. The mob is growing restless for blood, which means that you'll likely be sending something horrible to kill us very soon. But that just, it just makes me, it just gives me a little tickle, you know? But it's also the, uh, the sort of just, <laughs> the nonchalant attitude in these terrible situations for him. And he says, uh, I'm gonna get my sword back, and then I'm gonna use it to cut that alien horse's spine out. And he means it! <laughs> um, it's also, when he's joking with, uh, Fabius Bile as well, that's quite, they have a lot of nice interaction. I'll just read this one bit for you. They're talking about the poisons and toxins that Fabius has uh, and the potential that they could potentially kill him. Hmm, grunted Lucius. And all of these compounds that would kill me, they are your creations? Bile straightened, they are. And you take pride in your synthesis, I may assume? Yes, Fabius answered flatly. Then for your sake, Lucius grinned. I should hope they do not kill me. So Lucius is a great little character. He's a scarred up mess of a creature. (laughs) And I hope to see a lot more of him going forward. Um, there was just a couple of little things that I did find in the novel, which are quite interesting, which I haven't seen anywhere else. The one is that Fabius Bile did, in fact, clone a Fulgrim, and Lucius was dispatched by the Primarch to kill him, and he did, as it was just born, as it just came out of its uh, sack, or whatever you want to say it was, amniotic sack. It was like a fleshy ball. It wasn't a test tube, you know? He uh, cut the thing's head off. He didn't kill Fabius. He let him go, but... Um, yeah, so that was that's that's a pretty major thing that Fabius has done. So I'm interested I'm interested to see what happens with Fabius going forward. Also, we get a sort of a hint at the time that this is happening. Now this is before the thirteenth Great Crusade, before the Fall of Cadia, before the Dark Imperium era. This is a while before then. Um because one of the drugs that Fabius gifts Lucius with now, who he has put on his backpack and basically these drugs are there to uh, give him a boost different aspects to improve him to stimulate him one of them is from a tyranid and fabius says that it's a new species that has just become just entered the galaxy basically and it's from their adrenal glands or whatever so we can sort of basically judge this as the turret before the tyrannic wars or during the tyrannic wars so that's that's quite interesting in terms of timing so hopefully the next book will be further along that track and hopefully it'll all end up linking together. And that's the thing I wanted to talk about as well. Um, I would love if um, the Fabius Bile novels 
have a bit of a mention of Lucius in the or the next novel of Lucius has anything to do with Fabius that they they concern the same kind of things because um that's the thing that's slightly upsetting for instance that when he meets Fabius there's no other members of the consortium there and I think that's probably because the writers don't know what the other writers are doing until it's done and they probably don't read each other's work that much you know I mean why would you you know you'd probably want to be separated so you weren't influencing each other other than the sort of the general arc if there is an arc if these are connected in some way so for instance but in one of the books it'd be nice to be like oh okay lucius is speaking with him but then there's these other characters from the fabius bile novels that are in this story so it's sort of connected it seems more linked together rather than being rather than being sort of more uh, just thrown in you know like there's a character thrown in and it's not quite the same character or it doesn't have the same or it doesn't have the same sort of feel as it doesn't in their own novels. That would be nice if there was a bit more of a link like that, but it's no big deal. It's um, They've done a good job of linking them together, and I feel like there's nothing out of the ordinary going on. So in terms of the book, I highly recommend it. I think it was a great little read. It was fun, it was interesting, it was clever, it was clever, and it was funny. And that's that's really the best you can hope for, I think, really. Um, it's a good combination of all these things. It wasn't slow, it was uh, steady-paced, it was fun. And uh, yeah, it's got a lot of interesting things. It was jumping around a lot to different uh, different characters, different, so on. Lucius was the main character, quite clearly, but um, the other characters he brought in, uh, he's done a really good job of giving them their own individuality, and I, I really like that. I'd like to see some of these characters again coming forward. They're interesting. I do recommend this book, and you should go and get it. And if you want to, use my affiliate link below. So yeah. I will see you next time for another spoiler review and I hope you enjoyed this. And if you didn't, um, sod off. (laughs) Alright, thank you very much for watching and remember to subscribe, like and share if you can. I've been the Border Prince, thanks very much for watching. Cheers. Hello fellow citizens. If you'd like to help a fellow Terran out, please use the affiliate links below. I can heartily recommend Element Games, I use them myself, and they've got a great service, and they've usually got a really chunky discount available on pretty much everything in the Warhammer range. Not to mention, they do War Machine, X-Wing, pretty much everything you can imagine. Also, I see the links to uh, some Amazon recommendations I've got for products that we've been discussing and are available through there. Not to mention the Amazon free trial, that's down below if you'd like to try that service out i use it myself it's pretty good even if you don't watch the tv the free postage is awesome also if you follow the link to my ebay account you can find a bunch of pro painted miniatures and other bits of bobs that are war game related that i'm going to be selling on there now if you're just looking to be generous there's a paypal link down below and anything you can send me is really appreciated i'll be happy to mention you and say thanks in the next video Down below as well, you can also find all my social media channels uh, and my blog. So pop along to them and if you want to ask me anything or get in touch or just see what I'm up to, I'll be updating regularly on progress of certain projects and what I've been doing. So yeah, I have been the Border Prince. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Cheers.